Sheila Wildman, and I'm Associate Director of the Health Justice Institute, the Dalhousie Health Justice Institute. We're grateful to convene today's lecture and this year's lecture series in Wignaghi, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We pay respect to the indigenous knowledges held by the Mi'kmaq people and the wisdom of their elders past and present. We also recognize that African Nova Scotians are a distinct people whose histories, legacies, and contributions have enriched that part of Mi'kmaq known as Nova Scotia for over 400 years. This is the first lecture in this year's Dalhousie Health Justice Institute seminar series. And yes, we've officially changed our name uh, from Health Law to Health Justice Institute. Uh, and bear with me, um, <laughs> that's meant to mark at least two things. One uh, is that law is both a potential tool of health justice and of injustice, of inequitable health outcomes reflecting the deep and systematic inequalities of colonialism, white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, and ableism. As a collective, we at Dalhousie's Health Justice Institute are interested in convening conversations that reach into and through and beyond the law to conversations about justice, and we mark that as our name change. And two, second point, our change name, which decenters law, conveys our interdisciplinarity. So the Health Justice Institute brings the faculties of health, medicine, dentistry, and law, together with representatives of other disciplines, and with students, policymakers, and the diverse publics we serve, to engage an array of perspectives on and methods of exploring the meaning and determinants of health and health justice. I just want to point out a couple of people beyond myself as we start up the series for this year and before turning to introducing Dr. Sack. So first, an invisible person, just invisible for the moment, <laughs> our Institute's director, Matthew Herder. He gives his regrets today and wanted me to welcome you all on his behalf. I also want to recognize the critical role in this series of the Institute's Administrative Coordinator, Ashley Johnson. There she is in the back. Great round of applause. Thank you so much, Ashley. And so, so much to make these seminar lectures happen. And last, uh, uh, I also want to recognize, I think maybe an invisible person at this moment that's so present uh, for us, our wonderful new Dean at the Law School, Sarah Hardy. Uh, mention and recognition there. Um, just a couple more words to introduce the series as a whole before turning to our much anticipated speaker for today. This is the 26th year and the 201st lecture in this seminar series. So once again, we offer eight lectures to the end of March. And this year, we're framing our lectures around the deceptively straightforward question, what is health justice? Today's lecture by Professor Sarah Seck provides a critical foundation for this year's series as we explore that question. So I cast my mind back to almost exactly one year ago when I faced the hard task of introducing this seminar series, just a few days after the death of our longtime law school colleague and friend, environmental law scholar, Meinhard Dwell, taken from us in untimely fashion in a road accident while riding his bike. I found myself marking the tragic end to my heart's life and life's work on a day that, just like today, was marked as a day of international climate action, a global strike for climate reparations and justice. I said a year ago that the personal tragedy that we were all so rawly still absorbing was amplified and given a new force by our convening on that day of action. I committed us as an institute and as members of a common humanity to do more to consider the deep relationship between health and the environment, and to respond to the enormous, inequitable global suffering that the resource extraction and consumption brought by us in the global north have unleashed in the form of climate change. I committed on behalf of the Institute, now the Health Justice Institute, to do better in making connections between health justice and environmental justice, and between talk and action. So it's in this spirit that we bring you today's lecture by Dr. Sarah Sack on plastics pollution, 
and human rights-based efforts to abate it. It's in this spirit as well that we convene our next talk from McGill, Sebastian Jodouin, on September 29th on addressing and addressing the differential climate vulnerabilities of persons with disabilities. I take the occasion now to mark in a similar spirit to my recollections of Meinhardt and the commitment that his passing spurred, the recent passing of another social justice warrior who lived here in our community, disability rights activist Stephen Esty, who was taken from us this past Monday. Steve contributed centrally to the negotiation and drafting of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, to the passage of provincial and national accessibility laws, and to the recent passage of the Canada Disability Benefit, and to many other human rights victories, domestic and international. Steve's passing is being marked this week by disability justice warriors around the world. We will strive here at the Health Justice Institute to keep building, too, on these critical foundations of health and social justice. So now, finally, to turn the spotlight to our own justice warrior, Professor Sarah Sack. Sarah is the Yogis and Ketty Chair in Human Rights Law and Director of the Marine and Environmental Law Institute here at the Schubert School of Law. She teaches and researches and is a global scholarly leader at the intersection of environment and human rights, international law, and business. Recent co-edited books include the 2021 Cambridge Handbook on Environmental Justice and Sustainable Development, and the 2021 Research Handbook on Climate Change Law and Loss and Damage, as well as recent volumes of the Ocean Yearbook. In the last few years, she's undertaken research contracts through Dalhousie with the UN Environmental Program on topics relating to business, human rights, and the environment. These include a project elaborating on human rights informed responsibilities, uh, sorry, human rights informed responsible business climate action and the focus of today's presentation, a human rights based approach to plastic pollution. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sack. Thank you, Sheila, for the wonderful introduction and it's a great pleasure to an honor to be here sharing this work with you today <laughs> yes <laughs> um, the photo here um, is from uh, Von Von Wong Productions the credit turn off the plastic tap this is an image um, that was taken in Nairobi of a sculpture that was built um, at the time of discussions and negotiations around um, whether, uh, and if so, how, to address plastic pollution through a treaty. That process is ongoing and uh, not yet finished, and we'll see where it ends. Um, but it hadn't even begun at the time that I was asked to undertake the work um, that I'm going to share with you today. Uh, and the image uh, is designed to signify, really, this need to turn off the plastic tap. Um, and that's going to be really difficult because plastics are everywhere and very much a part of our society. And so this is another challenge, but we can figure this out. So what I'm going to do today first is just briefly reflect on why plastic pollution can and must be thought of as a health problem and a health justice problem. Say a few words about the plastic treaty negotiation process and what led up to it. Um, and then the focus is going to be sharing lessons from the development of training materials on a human rights-based approach to plastic pollution, um, which I was asked to undertake uh, by the UN Environment Program. And here you can sort of subdivide what I'm going to share with you as materials that are focused on understanding um, the component parts of a right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment on the one hand, and on the other hand, how to understand business responsibilities to respect human rights and circularity, um, both through the lens of international legal instruments. And then finally, I'll conclude just briefly with some reflections on plastics and health justice. So why think about plastics and health? Um, what I did here was just to cut and paste a very small sample of headlines from The Guardian from 2020 and 2023 that say things like microplastics found in human blood for the first time, microplastics found deep in lungs of living people for the first time, plastics cause wide-ranging health issues from cancer to birth defects, 
landmark study finds. Recycled plastic can be more toxic and is no fix for pollution, Greenpeace warns. Key messaging here is these are from studies from 2022 to 2023. And you can see that within them, there's a large amount of first time and also uncertainty. This is reflected in where we are. So I'm guessing most of you probably aren't familiar with the planetary's boundary framework work of the Stockholm Resilience uh, Center. Um, this has been ongoing for a while, but what they've been trying to map are what they describe as sort of, you know, planetary boundaries for different environmental problems. Um, and there's actually a new one that came out two days ago after I made this slide, and I didn't add it, so <laughs> you can go look that one up. But the key points here are in 2015, if you look at the top one, you can see where climate change is. So the green is, this is a safe operating space for humanity. The yellow is, uh-oh. The orange is, oh dear. And including overshooting what are seen as planetary boundaries. Now the good news is if you look at ozone depletion, it's nicely in the green. And at one time it was in the yellow, but we have an ozone treaty that actually works. And so it's no longer in overshoot position. Again, in that image, you can see climate change, which is really in the headlines now, is actually sort of mildish yellow compared to some of the others, like biodiversity loss that are in the orange. There's a little bit there called novel entities, and I know you can't see the print because it's way too small, but the novel entities part in 2015 says, not yet quantified. In 2022, it was quantified, and that's the giant orange thing there that looks like it's sort of going, <laughs> going over the chart. Um, this is referring to chemicals and toxic substances, including plastics, and plastics notably. And this, one of the problems has been that since the 1950s, um, these substances have been used increasingly, 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 and even in the last sort of 20 years, the use of plastics has dramatically increased and is projected to continue to increase. But thinking back to the previous slide, we're only just starting to understand what its implications are for human health. From the perspective of the UN Environment Program, um, it's helpful sometimes to understand and to, to not just think about climate change on its own, but rather to understand its relationship with other problems. And so they're currently using this triple planetary crisis framing that talks about the interdependent nature of climate nature loss, biodiversity, and pollution and waste. Um, on the left is an image that we developed actually for the other project, which was designed to sort of convey that the reason we're in this triple planetary crisis is really because of unsustainable production and consumption patterns, and all of these have impacts on human rights, and this includes rights to health. How did I get to being asked to do what it was <laughs> that I'm going to share with you today? Um, first of all, the UN Environment Program has been aware that there's been a plastics issue for quite a long time, but this has come from attention, the obvious issue that has emerged in the context of the marine environment. So you can think about the, you know, huge collections of plastic trash circulating in different parts of the Pacific and, and so on and so on, pictures of marine mammals that are, you know, ingesting uh, plastic bags and et etc cetera, etc cetera. this has been something that people have been aware of for quite a long time um, and also particularly in some parts of the world there's been greater attention to the impacts on rivers coastal communities sewage storm water um, and infrastructure so the on part of the slide, I have reference to the coordinating body of the East Asian Seas. This is a regional seas instrument um, that is designed to address all kinds of things. And marine litter writ large, which includes plastics, has been on their agenda for a very long time. On the right is reference to um, the UN Environment Program's work gradually over the years recognizing plastic waste first as one of the biggest threats to the world's oceans um, and secondly noting the kind of initiatives it's undertaken including the global partnership on marine litter 
with the aim of bringing together government, civil society, local authorities, academia, and the private sector to find realistic solutions to reducing and managing marine litter. And the aim of this, of course, is to address issues um, in the marine litter area that include uh, economies, ecosystems, animal welfare, and human health worldwide. So now, March 2022, the UN Environment Assembly adopted a resolution towards negotiating an internationally legally binding instrument to end plastic pollution. Um, as I say, this is ongoing. There will be a negotiating um, session in Canada in April 2024. Um, there's a draft, a zero draft of this treaty that's now available that one can look at, and there are lots of different options on, on ways forward. Um, one thing that's been very clear is the importance of taking what's described as a full life cycle approach to the plastics problem, and I'll explain what that means um, in a moment. Now, in 2021, I was approached by the UN Environment Program and somebody at the coordinating body of the East Asian Seas to undertake a preliminary research project which was to pull together a toolbox of resources on a, plastic, on a human rights-based approach to plastic pollution. Um, at the time, I didn't know anything about plastic pollution. This is not something I had been thinking about, not on my agenda, no idea. Um, but it is something, but certainly the human rights and environment intersection was something that was very much on my agenda, as was business responsibilities for human rights and what that means for a, through a human rights and environment lens. Um, and the idea was first to pull together this toolbox of resources to share with their partners, and secondly, through a second contract, um, to develop a set of training materials that could be delivered virtually in the region with, in collaboration with partners um, on a human rights-based approach to plastic pollution with the aim of training um, businesses as well as states, governments, NGOs, and everybody. Um, I assembled a team, a big team at first, of lots of students to help me figure out what was going on. Um, and then uh, in contract two, um, I was assisted uh, in particular by PhD candidate uh, Kevin Burke, and also by Victoria Konyat, who was an LLM candidate here at, um, at the time doing health law work. Um, and so if you actually look at the Sea Circular website, you'll find a section there where they still have um, available videos of one of the training sessions uh, that we did, and you can access materials there, and they're also available through um, the UN Environment Program's sort of website more, more generally. Um, COPSI and UNEP together with, uh, um, uh, created this initiative called Sea Circular, that's what this slide is about, and their aim was very much to address the plastics uh, crisis through what they're calling the plastic value chain um, and to inspire market-based solutions as well as encouraging enabling policies to present, prevent marine plastic pollution. So the project was not one that was linked to what should the plastics treaty look like, it was not one that was specific to, if you think about you know, environmental law, how can we help states put in place better environmental laws in different areas. It was to draw upon ideas from international human rights law in relation to the environment and business responsibilities for human rights to develop trainings that would help us think about how to come up with solutions. The context one key piece of the context um, in the region, and I'll note that the partners that we worked with were um, WWF in the Philippines, who's done a lot of work on extended producer responsibility, um, and also the Indonesian Business Council for Sustainable Development that's been working on a lot of circularity things. Um, the partners shared with us ideas for different case studies that we integrated into the trainings. Um, and this was very, I've sort of got them through the slides, I won't spend much time talking about many of them, but for some are useful, I think, for context. 
One is that in the Canadian context, we use plastics, we use way more plastics. Canadians and Americans use way more plastics than anybody in the world, and we use far, far more than anybody else. Um, but we have this thing called municipal waste management, where we use the plastics, we stick them in something, hopefully it's the right recycling container, and then it's magically vanished from our, <laughs> right? We don't really know where it goes. Um, and we'll get back to that in a minute because we should think about that a bit more. Um, in terms of in um, the Philippines, for example, in many parts of the region that I was uh, tasked with thinking about, um, there are not municipal waste management systems. And so much of this work is done by informal workers, often referred to as waste pickers. And they um, have organized in different groups and are actually quite active in trying to ensure that um, they are included in the plastics treaty process. Um, but one of the reasons that I was sort of called in, I think, was because of a sense that coming from a business and human rights perspective, there's a lot of material and a lot of thinking about the responsibilities of businesses for workers and also informal workers, and how to ensure that that responsibility is integrated into everything the business does. So this is sort of the context, right? It's a different one from in the Canadian context. Um, and the question is, you know, there's obviously a lot of impacts on informal sector workers who are working with um, the, you know, collecting these wastes um, and a lot of health protection um, issues. But another piece referring back to our magically disappearing um, municipal plastic waste <laughs> um, is the problem that um, historically wealthy nations have been tending to export a lot of their plastic waste to other nations, despite lots of international law that would suggest uh, this may not be something one can do. And China was historically importing a lot of it, and in 2017 they said, okay, that's enough, we're not taking it anymore started going to lots of other countries in the region, um, and some states started to ban it, but unfortunately that's often not the end of it. It sort of just led to increased in illegal imports, illegal dumping, and illegal incineration. So on top of all the issues, all of the challenges in, in the Southeast Asian countries themselves, is the challenge, and it's not just in Asian countries, there's also a lot going on in the African context, for example. Um, they're having to deal with the waste from the West. Okay. So business and human rights. This is, again, a weird thing that many people don't know much about, but it's actually gaining more and more increasing credibility. And so um, this is, again, why I was asked to assist. So generally speaking, we think of states as duty bearers in human rights law states having a duty to protect. In the environmental context, we expect states to pass laws and to regulate things. We expect our rights and everything to be protected by states. But of course, international human rights law exists because states often don't do their job. They often violate rights. The question from a business perspective is, if a state is violating rights, do you as a business just say, well, hey, I'm complying with state law. Done. Sorry, not my problem. Or is there a responsibility under international human rights law that all actors need to step up and pay attention to human rights and take on human rights responsibilities? And this has been a very long-standing discussion at the Human Rights Council in various human rights uh, sectors. Um, and, uh, the short version of the story is that in 2011, the UN Human Rights Council adopted guiding principles on business and human rights that reflect what's referred to as the Protect, Respect, Remedy framework. Um, they were developed through a multi-stakeholder process. Um, I was involved at different stages in some of this, um, and so I'm very familiar with the history content and how this is supposed to um, operate. Um, the state duty, of course, states are supposed to do their thing. That includes regulating businesses. But when they don't, businesses are not off the hook. Businesses should never assume they're off the hook. Businesses have their own independent responsibility to respect human rights. And this includes to adopt a policy commitment to human rights, 
to engage in human rights due diligence processes, and to ensure remediation of human rights harms. And the third pillar focuses in on access to remedy. At the same time, a lot of work has been going on at the Human Rights Council on human rights and environment and human rights and toxic substances. We now have a new special rapporteur focused on climate change. There's been a special rapporteur working on health for a really long time. Um, and I was quite familiar with um, this work. And so putting together the work of the special rapporteurs on toxic substances and on human rights and environment into thinking about the plastic problem with the aim of developing guidance for business um, seemed to be what our mission was. <laughs> so um, I'll note that the special rapporteur on toxics and human rights, there have been several of them, and there have been some really incredibly useful reports coming out of there. Um, some recent, uh, one that came um, right as we were starting this work was very specifically focused on plastics. Um, but there were other ones from the past that had, had developed principles on the rights of workers, formal and informal, in relation to toxics. Um, precautionary principles in the toxics context. Right to science. Um, the special rapporteurs on human rights and the environment had also developed lots of different useful materials. Uh, perhaps most notably the 2018 framework principles on human rights and the environment developed by John Knox. And, uh, John Knox's reports, but also more recently many of David Boyd's reports, fleshing out aspects of a holistic understanding of a right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, um, were what served as our sort of background materials as we tried to figure out um, what we were going to do in these training materials. And so this is what we did. Um, first, again, the task was to look at the full life cycle of plastics. Um, our tendency is, you know, we use it, we stick it in the recycling, and we assume it gets recycled. But in fact, um, an astonishingly small amount of plastic is effectively recycled. Globally, it's about 9%. Um, the other problem is, if we care about climate change, we should care about, climate, about plastics, because virgin plastics are 99% derived from fossil fuels. And so if you look at the linear plastic cycle and you start with extraction of fossil fuels through production, <coughs> transportation, use, consumption, waste generation, waste management, and disposal, and if at the disposal stage things are in landfills incinerated or dumped, they're not going back into being part of new plastics, and so we have more extraction of fossil fuels. This is a problem for all kinds of reasons, but including relates very clearly to climate. Um, in fact, there are many who think that as um, pressure has been put on fossil fuel, oil and gas producers to reduce production due to climate change, there has been a strategy shift to increase plastic production. As we were, again, looking through each of these stages, and our first set of training slides actually go through each of these stages and sort of explore the human rights implications at each one, and I'm not sharing that with you. Um, we drew heavily on the report of, the, uh, of Marcus Orlana on the Special Rapporteur on Toxic Substances and Human Rights and his report on plastics, which helpfully covered human rights implications at, at each stage. Um, the, again, I could spend easily 20 minutes on this, and I'm not going to, <laughs> so if you're interested, lots of training materials available online. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the aim, again, from the UN Environment Program's perspective in particular, is for um, us to move away from what they describe as the take, make, waste, linear, fossil fuel-dependent plastic cycle, and to move instead towards circularity. Now, what circularity means is something we'll talk about um, a little bit. But the main reason for this, again, is first, there are human rights impacts at each stage. And you know, secondly, it's just contributing to the continuing need to extract fossil fuels. And this is clearly not something we should be doing. Um, So that report came out in 2021, 
Um, as we were starting our work in this area, one big question for us was um, to what extent we draw upon the full range of human rights in the materials, rights to life, right to health, um, go, you know, sort of unpacking all of the different instruments that have informed all of the work of the different special rapporteurs to come up with um, the work that they have, um, or whether we should take a slightly different approach and to think, in a sense, more simply about framing this as something that could be solved through the adoption of what we're describing as sort of a holistic understanding of a right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Um, after, or just before we presented, I guess, our final training, um, in July 2022, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution which recognized the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment um, as a human right. Um, there's a lot of things that are interesting about that resolution, and it followed one from the um, Human Rights Council in, in November 2021, which is slightly different. Um, but for our purposes, what was um, particularly helpful, I guess, is that the UN General Assembly resolution also acknowledges the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. So within that recognition from the General Assembly, no states voting against, Canada did indeed vote in favor. Um, there was this, I mean, we didn't know at the time we were developing the materials, but once the recognition happened, it seemed a particularly good idea that we had in fact decided to adopt the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as a framework. The other reason for taking that approach is that while in the Canadian context we do not have constitutional recognition of such a right at all, we have, you know, Quebec has a bit, there's some stuff going on, um, but it's generally not, it's generally seen as this kind of, you know, a non-thing in Canada, right? <laughs> um, the very first conversation I had with our partners at the Indonesian Business Council for Sustainable Development, she referred to the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Why? Well, it's constitutionalized in Indonesia. In fact, it's constitutionalized in a number of the partner countries that we're working with, and it already is constitutionalized or very much a part of the law in many countries in the world. Um, and so that's also another reason for having adopted this sort of as a framework. So what does it mean to adopt it as a framework? Drawing on John Knox's um, 2018 framework principles is a very helpful um, structure, which I think is sort of hinted at in the first three principles. First, that states should ensure a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment in order to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights. But secondly, states should respect, protect, and fulfill human rights in order to ensure a safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And then third, states should prohibit discrimination and ensure equal and, that sounds wrong, and equal and something in relation to, whoa, um, in relation to the enjoyment of a safe, clean environment. Something, there's a mis word missing there. Um, key point being that equity and non-discrimination is a cross-cutting aspect of a framework that draws on the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Um, and so equity and non-discrimination um, must be understood as cross-cutting all of this. Um, so, and that's, I should just say, this is, we were asked to develop, you know, visuals to, <laughs> to accompany our work. Um, and so with um, some great help at Dell, we, we did this, and this particular image is designed to capture this sort of holistic understanding. So in the blue is the idea of substantive dimensions of the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, um, clean air, safe climate, clean water, healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, healthy food, and non-toxic places. On the left are procedural rights protections, and I will actually scroll through some other slides on that for a minute. And then underneath is this cross-cutting guarantee of equity and non-discrimination, the importance of centering groups, and individuals who are disproportionately affected by environmental harms. So I'm going to very quickly scroll through a bunch of slides here, in fact about 30 slides, just to give you a sense of some of the stuff that we had in these training materials before I then sort of turn to reflections on, on where we go. 
So what we were trying to do, drawing on different reports of different special rapporteurs in particular, was to reflect on uh, what would it mean if we all sought a right to clean air in relation to the different stages of the plastics life cycle. Similarly, what would it mean for a safe climate? What would a right to clean air look like through each stage of the plastics cycle? Healthy ecosystems and biodiversity, right to healthy food, non-toxic places. And then we asked our participants to reflect on their own organization's contributions. So evaluate how the contributions of your business or organization to the plastic life cycle impacts the substantive components of the right, including these different aspects. And then again, rather than sort of looking at a, you're bad, <laughs> you know, don't be bad, we took a, and how can you be good approach. So the last part is, does your business or organization take proactive action to support the substantive components of this right? And what would that look like? Similarly, with the procedural components, we drew on the work of the, the framework principles on human rights and the environment and also the work of the Special Rapporteur on Toxics um, to contemplate the different procedural um, dimensions, which includes, so from international environmental law, we often talk about sort of the three pillars of rights to information, public participation, and access to justice. This is flushed out in lots of different um, instruments. And here, through the framework principles, we have it uh, ex more expansively understood as including um, rights to freedom of expression and association, to education and information. Um, and um, principle four from the framework principles notes a very crucial dimension, which is the importance of ensuring that there is a safe and enabling environment for those who are described as environmental human rights defenders to operate free from threats, harassment, intimidation, and violence. And that's a huge issue in many parts of the world, and it's not one that Canada is immune to. Um, and so this is our next set of sort of, you know, how to think about this problem from a procedural rights perspective. Um, I'm trying to see the time. Okay. <laughs> Just, I'm watching my time over there. I'm good. Okay. Um, there's a bit of a reflection off it, so I can't see, can't quite see it, but Just we're good. 10 to the hour, it's about 12 minutes. Excellent. Perfect. So in the next set of slides, then, we drew upon these materials to pull out some sort of essential pieces for thinking about prevention, precaution, impact assessment, and application. Here, in part, the importance of avoiding false solutions, because one of the problems is um, Sometimes, in the effort to quickly address the problem, whether it's climate change or plastics, one can adopt solutions that may be worse or just create different problems from the ones that one is trying to avoid. And so always adopting a preventative and precautionary approach and ensuring that proper impact assessment is carried out um, is essential. And this includes, from a business and human rights perspective, the idea of business and human rights impact assessment. Um, so from here, you know, and, and I don't think I've noted this, but, you know, plastics, we, you know, there can be many classes on what are plastics and how do we understand the different pieces and et cetera, et cetera, and we're not doing that here. Um, but one of the other problems is uh, chemical additives to different plastics. So often you can have all kinds of stuff in there, and if it's not properly labeled and tracked, then even somebody who's trying to recycle plastics will be putting things together and have no idea what it actually is and what the synergistic effects might be. Um, so you, need, you can't do your prior assessment if you don't have information, and so the informational aspects are, are crucial. Um, and so, therefore, an entire slide on access to information, the right to science, education, public awareness, public participation, noting, of course, um, that some communities have different rights than others. So if we're thinking about self-determination rights of indigenous communities, this is something that's important to, um, to highlight as well. And then accountability and access to justice and remedy. And again, we had a reflection, identify steps your organization is taking in, in supporting the exercise of the procedural components. Um, 
And uh, this includes reflecting on how your organization might be supporting um, human rights defenders. The last part, equity and vulnerability, this cross-cutting piece, um, again, notes the importance drawing on the framework principles of prohibiting discrimination, ensuring equal and effective protection, um, but also the need to take additional measures to protect the rights of those who are most vulnerable to or at particular risk from environmental harm, taking into account their needs, risks, and capacities. An important piece of this that comes through in the, in the 2018 Guiding Principles, um, Guiding Principle Framework Principles, um, is the need to understand um, that many people may be particularly vulnerable to environmental harms because they have been historically discriminated um, against. And so um, integrating an understanding of sort of how to move beyond um, colonial practices and histories as part of this assessment um, of how to ensure and support those vulnerable or at, at particular risk is part of the process. Um, and so, again, we have a whole bunch of slides that also note the importance of thinking from an intersectional perspective, but of course, in these trainings, there's only sort of so much we can, we can do. Um, we went through <laughs> lots of different groups thinking about it. The formal in, and informal workers were obviously a part of this. Um, I'll just note the racial or other minorities and persons living in poverty. Um, there is a lot of work that the different special rapporteurs have been done on um, environmental justice issues relating to the siting of hazardous, um, hazardous um, whether it's hazardous, whether it's the waste, at the waste sort of stage of it, or whether it's at the production phase. Um, and so that's obviously, again, a part of the, part of the discussion. Okay. Um, and so again, asking them to reflect on all these different aspects. Um, so identify rights holders who may be disproportionately impacted by your organization's contribution to the plastics life cycle, including, and identify how and when your organization interacts with environmental human rights defenders. Make a commitment to protect, support, and collaborate with them to enable human rights responsible plastics action. So in the next bit, I'll just very quickly make reference to, again, some of the case studies that were helpfully shared by, by our partners. Um, and our partners were working on different aspects of this, in particular on the importance of how to ensure extended producer responsibility models were integrated into laws and policies in the region and, and other related things. Um, in the Philippines, there's a particular problem with what's referred to as the sachet economy. Um, and uh, corporate actors have contributed greatly to this problem, but it's also sort of in a weird way one that's um, a, <laughs> targeted at addressing or enabling access to products by those who are poor. And so um, sachets, very small sachets filled with lots of common household commodities like toothpaste, shampoo, coffee, cooking oil, are available to be purchased in sort of little single-use things. And if you can't afford to buy the whole bottle, it's helpful to be able to buy the little sachet, right? Um, of course, from the brand's perspective, you know, maybe it's more expensive to buy 30 sachets than to buy one bottle of the same amount. But if you're poor and you can't afford the whole bottle, then you're going to go with the sachets, right? They're very common. Um, the suggestion was that there were 163 million sachets used per day in the Philippines. Um, and this caused all kinds of different problems, but what's the solution? So at the time, Unilever was trying, claiming to be putting in place some kind of a recycling program to turn the sachets into school chairs or cement bricks. Um, and the idea was that the collection of this sachet waste would create opportunities for informal waste pickers. And there's also this idea of a plastic crediting model that would come in. Um, there's a lot of questions as to whether that ever really got off the ground in the way it was supposed to, and that was part of some of our discussions um, in some of the sessions, including with um, representative of, of Unilever. Um, but of course, 
ideally, there would be less dependency on the sachets and on these single-use plastics. Now, how to move away from that um, is tricky. I don't have a slide on, on this, but I'll just note that following this work, I was working with my postdoc, Tani Pryor, on thinking through the plastics challenges in the Arctic context. And uh, a different group has done a study um, with the Sami uh, in which the, what they were studying in a sense was what were all the sort of local practices before people started using plastics. So what are the things that, what are the practices and the ways that have been replaced by the plastic economy? And how can or should they be brought, you know, be better supported? So that's a really important and tricky and local question, um, but really important part of it. Um, and then we had little reflections on these, right? Like how do if we think through this problem using these different sort of components of an environmental human rights lens, what would this, what would this mean? And also transitioning into our third model, which was focused on business responsibilities, um, what would it mean for businesses to take responsible action to prevent and remedy the human rights impact identified um, and also an awareness of might the solution suggested raise different human rights concerns. So I've already mentioned the guiding principles on business and human rights and I'll just quickly note that um, the guiding principles have been implemented in all kinds of other responsible business conduct guidance, guidance tools. There is a working group on business and human rights at the Human Rights Council. They have helpfully come out with different kinds of reports including one um, specifically aimed at um, ensuring respect for human rights defenders, which is very helpful in suggesting to businesses and others that if we're actually serious about sustainable action, instead of looking at human rights defenders as enemies to be, you know, <laughs> shut down and litigated against, um, one should treat them as knowledge holders with important knowledge and ideas that should be valued and incorporated into way steps forward. Um, and so we asked businesses, what would it mean for you to uh, adopt business and human rights approaches? And I'll note, um, at the time, while we were working with the UN Environment Program, um, I was following closely and, and know people within the UN Development Program who had been launching at the same time a very rich business and human rights in Asia program. And so there's some parallels and overlaps. Um, but these aren't the only ones. There's also the UN Global Compact that has been doing work on responsible business conduct, including sustainable ocean principles. And so we shared some of the principles from this with participants. There's the work of the OECD. It's guidelines for multinational enterprises. It's due diligence guidance. And in particular, this sort of model, um, which is very useful um, in terms of how to think about uh, problems and solutions and uh, adopting risk-based due diligence to address human rights and environmental and other, other issues. And so we developed various little uh, images to try to uh, you know, share and reflect what would it mean to adopt a human rights and circularity embedded approach to product design. Um, what would it mean to do the same for waste management? Um, and then there's the question of responsibility, liability, and remedy. So the, in the climate context, I will say as an aside, it's a massive missing piece of the climate regime, which is highly problematic. Um, and we have seen, and it seemed particularly appropriate in, in the context of the region to reflect on the responsibility and liability piece, um, because the Human Rights Commission of the Philippines had engaged in a many year long inquiry into the responsibilities of businesses for climate change. Um, coming from their report, we reflected on how could that report, report apply or be thought of in light of the plastics problems. Could, should plastic producers also be held liable for the human rights and environmental impacts of plastic pollution and waste as well as each stage of the life cycle? Um, we reflected on what the different special rapporteurs had to say about remedy and we developed our little business and human rights informed kind of image to think about the responsibilities of businesses and how this shifts depending on whether they have caused the problem, contributed to it or are directly linked and 
um, went from there. Um, again, lots of different case studies we could share. I'll probably end with this and then a few, um, a few reflections. And this, I think, points to the complexity again of the problem. Um, this case study was shared with us by our Indonesian partners. And it's the problem of a tofu factory that for a very long time was burning plastics for fuel because the plastics were, that was the cheapest way they could get fuel. The problem is that they weren't aware of all of the uh, um, toxins that were coming out of the plastic as it was being burned and what its implications were for local food systems. So once this information had been shared and revealed, they then shifted. And they shifted to burning firewood. And of course, that will have its own implications if there's a shortage of, if one is concerned about deforestation and there, there are issues there. And so I think this one illustrates also the way in which the plastics crisis is very much intertwined with the climate crisis and energy access as a part of it. So there are questions as to whether, are there good ways of burning or incinerating plastics such as to use them as an energy source? And there are very hotly held opinions on either side of that. Um, are there ways of doing chemical waste recycling that could be safe? Or is this again something that's likely to be cited in low income communities of color where the negative impacts will be disproportionately felt. This is ongoing all over. And so we reflected on that case study. There's another circularity case study. And from this, you know, here we are. Lessons from this, human rights-based approach to plastics for health justice for Canada. Um, I was asked to do this work for a very different context, and I haven't had the time or the funding to reflect on, okay, what are we actually doing in the Canadian context? Um, I do know that you know, the federal government's taken a few steps forward to try to address some plastics issues, um, and is currently, its regulatory initiatives are being challenged by a group that calls themselves the Responsible Plastics Coalition because, as is always, we spend a lot of time in environmental law talking about how the government passes a law and then they get told that it was beyond their jurisdiction under federalism doctrines. And so, you know, it's sort of this back and forth, right? Can the federal government regulate this? Is this, a, you know, a, is this something that's a provincial, municipal thing? If they do it, how should they do it? So we're sort of wrapped in that the usual um, environmental federalism frustrated, unhelpful space, unfortunately, as part of what's going on. Um, but more generally, the business and human rights approach and the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, neither of them are well known, well understood, well integrated in the Canadian context. These are actually better understood in many parts of the world outside of Canada. But I think the time is right, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to share these materials precisely for that reason. I think the time is right for us to turn our minds to what the potential might be of these kind of instruments, these kind of teachings, these kind of thinkings, um, for being more responsible consumers, producers of plastics, um, and for ensuring that information is gathered and available and known about the impacts of these products and others that we use, including for health and environmental justice, both of which are intertwined. And I think that's all I was going to say. <laughs> Plenty of time for questions, uh, and Sarah, I can let you field. Sure. I see Andrea in the back there with one to start, and maybe I'll let you field them after that. Okay, please. Hi. 
What was super interesting about the process leading to the development of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights is that it very much involved businesses. Business organizations were very much there, as were human rights groups. I had the weird experience of co-convening the only North American consultation as part of that process, which involved bringing together corporate and securities lawyers from all over the world, as well as businesses, as well as human rights groups. And I was accidentally copied on a message that Amnesty International sent to somebody saying, why would we go to this meeting with all these business people? And I think the business and human rights movement has tried to change that, and I think has been successful in starting a conversation. So there's an annual forum in Geneva, the, the UN Forum on Business and Human Rights, and you will see the big multinationals there and all the human rights groups and rights holders, and there are not happy conversations, but important conversations that take place. And coming out of this, we were asked to do the trainings, but there's also, um, we, and we did all of this stuff virtually, there's also, um, through the support of UNDP and others, now a big um, Asian Forum on Business and Human Rights. And again, the business act, the large scale businesses are there. There's recently a new African Forum on Business and Human Rights. It's going to be, it's not an easy or quick process, but the educational piece is crucial. Businesses can't and won't do anything if they don't know what they're supposed to do. And so if we keep teaching things as if businesses are always, are never have the potential of embracing these things, we can't make the motion. Now there's a lot that can also be said about structures of corporate law and how that needs to shift as part of this. And that's again, you know, something I can speak to, but I would say it's slowly starting. Um, absolutely. I made the mistake, <laughs> Natalie and I were talking about this yesterday, you're supposed to have a pen so you can write down your questions, and of course I forgot to bring the pen. <laughs> so you might need to remind me of that first one. Um, no, hang on. Okay, I know, I know. So in the, in the first thing, so this is a very simplified version. Thank you. <laughs> this is a very simplified version of um, what is essentially, I mean, we, our aim had been to put together sort of a 20 to 40 page background document, and our background document is huge by comparison to that because it's so complicated. And because, you know, when I say plastics, that's an immense simplification, right? There's all kinds of different kinds, um, and for details, you can look at, you know, all the different work that UNEP had done. In engaging with, um, with our colleagues, we had them, um, and Sea Circular has been quite active in this, trying to seek sort of good examples of producers that are transitioning. So you have to look at or transforming their operations. You have to kind of look at what is it that they're doing, what are they transforming from and to. Some of it is easy. Um, <clears throat> a tremendous amount of plastics goes into packaging. It's completely unnecessary in many, many cases. Easy to just, you know, stop. In other cases, very difficult. Plastics used in the medical community. Um, and different kinds of plastics, as you say. So again, <clears throat> it's complicated and we attempted to, <clears throat> we attempted to not, excuse me, <coughs> we, I'm lo to totally losing my voice, not sure why. <clears throat> we attempted to be sufficiently general given the nature of what we were doing, but at the same time to provide little sort of opportunities of guidance for some of the, the specifics. Um, Oh my gosh, no, I've forgotten the second question, which was, hang on. Yes, Impact assessment, yes. <laughs> okay. So, some interesting thoughts on this. I mean, one question, which is not your question, is what should go through impact assessment? So, if you go back to thinking about the uh, plastics life cycle, we know there's lots of impact assessment in the environmental impact assessment that happens sort of on the fossil fuel stage, not, not enough. Not too much that really happens when it comes to the building of petrochemical facilities. Um, <clears throat> transport, so there's an example where a ship that was you know, carrying plastic pellets spilled this huge amount of them um, in, and I forget where they were off the coast, but it caused like a huge environmental disaster. Should there be an impact assessment of shipping? And what is on ships? Same with rail lines. 
Most people have no idea what's going on the rail lines that are going past. And a lot of this is stuff that if it spills is going to cause a disaster, as we know. Um, but people don't know about it. So impact assessment sort of more broadly should perhaps be used more. People should have more access to information about what's going on at each stage. Then it comes down to what kind of impact assessment, and that's tricky. Um, the you know, human rights and, and environmental assessment is a tool that's been around for a long time. The human rights impact assessment can be and should be integrated into environmental assessment, I think, in a, in a holistic kind of way, and we're starting to see that. Um, but then there's strategic and et cetera, et cetera, and I know you know a lot about that. <laughs> Patricia, and then, yeah. The, initially, in the work that I'd done in the business and human rights context and human rights and environment context, I hadn't grappled with the circularity question. So this project was, I mean, it was immensely eye-opening for me on so many levels, but one of them was the need to think about circularity at the same time as thinking about human rights, that those two have to go together. Um, then it becomes a question of sort of how, how to do this and what, what that um, means. I'll note that having the will to actually do something is the first step. And so again, I have not done the deep dive research in the Canadian context, but I have some concerns. We know we have a fossil fuel dependent country, um, and in particular that Alberta is, I mean, not, Alberta's not the only one, but Alberta is perhaps particularly um, keen on continuing the fossil fuel economy. The federal government has said every now and then and sort of stepped up and looked like it's playing an active role in the, uh, you know, how to address plastics. And yet at the same time, I saw within the last year, um, you know, statements from Alberta that um, uh, building more petrochemical plants so as to produce more plastics was on the agenda and federal government support for that, right? I'm like, okay, that's not looking good, right? Um, <laughs> so that's the first thing. but. There's also a lot of, I mean, this is in, in a sense sidestepping, but not so much, um, some real concerns also in how the structure of the treaty is going to unfold. So we know in the climate context that there's the use of offsets um, and questions as to whether if you're actually, you know, you're, you're, you're buying a credit to offset your emissions, but you're not actually reducing your emissions. We're seeing the same potential stuff through this idea of plastic credits and circularity emerging in the, in the plastic context. Um, some of this is uh, partnering with informal waste pickers, ensuring that they're supported, that they have better lifestyle and health things, but at the same time, gathering the waste might help keep it out of the marine environment, but what happens with it when it's being gathered, so there might be a credit that's given because a company is helping ensure it's gathered, but then we don't know what's happening next. Now, I mean, if that kind of thing gets embedded in the treaty, we're in the same, exactly in the same spot as we are with climate, which is we're pretending to do stuff, but we're not, right? Um, anyway, there's, there's more that could be said about that, but I'll, I'll just note the, um, the other thing is, when I was doing all of this, I was thinking about circularity, but I'm seeing now some people saying circularity is the wrong thing, we need a regenerative economy, and that that's even different and, and beyond. Um, I think there's one question here and then one over here. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely, um, it's really important to be very aware of that. Um, and one can't say that the human rights debased approach will capture everything. But there's the potential for it to capture more than it might traditionally be thought to capture by attention to this um, exploring the human rights approach to what is referred to in this particular report by John Knox uh, to a healthy biosphere. So if you, if instead of thinking of humans over here and environment is over here and ecosystems is over here, if we can move to better understandings that humans are part of ecosystems in the biosphere and that harming the biosphere is harming humans, then a human rights based approach can help to overcome the limitations like that understand that enriched understanding it's you know an enriched and changed understanding of the human i think is sort of at the at the center of it but that must be central to it otherwise absolutely all those risks and limitations are there so my sense to be honest overall 
is that most people don't actually understand what a right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment means, and certainly don't understand all of its component parts. And so there's a real tendency, and we see this in sustainable development as an example. Sustainable development is often described as balancing environment, economy, and society. And they're all understood as separate, but they're not, and balancing is the wrong thing. And that needs to be confronted, but it can't be confronted if people don't actually, if we don't train and talk about it, right? So in that image, it's not balancing. Ecosystems, you know, there are planetary boundaries. There, is a, there are healthy ecosystems as a floor, and you can't have sustainable and resilient societies without healthy ecosystems and economy as part of that. And all I can say is right now, the dominant way in which all of this stuff is taught is not in a way that takes what I would call an, a, you know, an eco-relational approach to the human and to economy. So it's starting with training, <laughs> it's starting with training, it's starting with this, sharing, hoping that some people in here might think this is useful and for us to work with, and definitely doing it with industry and industry associations. So you At the same, the right, you have the right audience. <laughs> this isn't the, it's the, I think any audience is the right group. I, I think there's real, I think it's really important to have the other ones. But I will say at the same time we were doing this, we were doing a project with the OECD on responsible business climate action. And, you know, that's um, same ideas, but, you know, much trickier audience because the OECD has to kind of satisfy all of its constituents and they're going to not want uh, you know, you not want you to rock the boat too much. But I think, I think increasingly, so I'm, I'm the optimist, I think education can play a role. Um, and, and I really do think that increasingly people are realizing that, I, I'm hopeful that people are realizing that maybe new ways of thinking and knowing is going to help us move this forward. But yeah. Good <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> to do this we've um we're out of time come, yeah so uh, <laughs> no problem so i'm going to please just sit, stick in your chairs for one second longer so we can properly um, we'll keep the nice slide thank up. <laughs> and uh yeah and recognize um just the value of what uh what we just heard today um i also want to invite you if you happen to be sticking around uh, to a gathering, just an informal gathering that some that we're having between three and five today in room four eleven. So health uh, health law students, environment law students are invited to come and interact with faculty um, to talk a little bit more about these very questions: the interaction of health and environment, and the laws that apply, international law, marine law. Our visitor, Natalie Klein, uh, is also, um, we're so grateful to have her here from University of New South Wales. Um, and she's also going to be present. And there may even be a little bit of food <laughs> if you can hang on till then. Uh, but I really, I enjoyed that last intervention because I was reminded again that this is an international day of, of action. It's a, this global strike for climate justice. and there's. There's a really interesting tension for me, and some people felt it quite viscerally. Am I going to the strike, where I'm going to stand in the streets, or do what I do in the streets, or am I coming to this talk? And it and and it, you're weighing those things there. Well, what what is the value of talking and educating ourselves uh, and others about these legal norms and regimes that Sarah, uh, we've heard today, is so actively um, working inside, inside and outside, and really pushing what the inside is or was. These questions of jurisdiction are just fundamental to, to what, you've, what you've presented to us, jurisdiction around, is it just the state? Is it the, well, what is business? What is the point of this thing we call business, right? Um, and so, sorry, that's me starting to. <laughs> Uh, Riff, uh, last, last couple <laughs> words. Um, I first met, so I've already given you my formal introduction uh, to Sarah Seth, but I wanted to just add this. I first met Sarah in a lineup on our first day of law school in Toronto, and she sort of turned around and we locked eyes, and I could see right away that she had this tremendous, you know, quiet, sort of outsider intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> and I just knew, you are my people. Um, and uh, uh, so in my own words, uh, Sarah is a big, uncompromising dreamer and doer, right? So uh, Sarah steps up. And just to go back to, I'm sorry, but the sad story I started with when we so tragically lost 
our colleague Meinhardt a year ago, um, Sarah let go a desperately awaited sabbatical to shoulder the various teaching and other institutional, you know, urgent needs that, that arose so suddenly, and she did that with her usual grace and her unyielding, you know, excellence and her willingness to do the work that's required to build a strong and sustainable uh, community of research and teaching uh, and social and climate justice leadership. Uh, and so just this, you know, last point, and Sarah, don't <laughs> blush too hard, but, you know, your scholarship, your guidance of a whole raft, like, bevy of graduate, brilliant graduate students, um, your enormous willingness to do the work of, uh, uh, and, and that includes the mostly uncelebrated work behind the scenes <laughs> that's needed to shift law and practice toward health and climate justice is just an inspiration to us all. So please join me again. <laughs> poster of our health law, uh, uh, our health, health justice a seminar series, I still have to adjust. I noted that our next lecture is September 29th, uh, Professor Sebastian Jodouin from uh, McGill talking about the climate vulnerability of people with disabilities, how do we address that again move from talk to action. Please come bring your friends and I, I want to just note the one after that on November 3rd, so about a month later, is only online. That's the only one all year that's only online. Stanford professor uh, Rabbi Adel is going to talk about the American insanity defense. And I really encourage you. She's an incredibly sparky scholar. Uh, so you really want to sign on to that one uh, by Zoom webinar. And otherwise, take a look at the full array of lectures and come on out. Thank you.